so I'm going to be, uh, I'll try to be quick here. So the future of nuclear power. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, what the kind of horizon is looking like for nuclear power globally. So that means generation three and generation four reactors, uh, as well as the uh, IDA project and uh, SMRs. And then I'll talk about the future of nuclear power locally, what, what's going on in Ontario, and uh, go, go on from there. Should I just press enter? No, oh, left Okay. So uh, next generation reactors. Uh, so generation three reactors. So these are, there's a couple of different designs. Uh, one is up the advanced Cantor reactor, so that's coming from Canada. The other is AP1000, which is coming from Westinghouse, which is the US design. And uh, then there's the EPR, which is an Arriva France design. And uh, there's also, I forgot to mention, uh, a South Korean uh, TEPCO uh, design, which is also uh, being built around the world. So what makes them generation three? So uh, what have we learned from nuclear power, uh, from this generation of nuclear power that we're going to improve upon? So one thing is that it's a standardized design. Uh, so for reducing licensing periods, they're looking at, uh, this is the way it's basically ensuring that licensing can be quick and efficient. Uh, additional power and more efficient use of uranium, but also, very importantly, uh, has some safety features. So what you'll find, uh, the ECR, which I'll describe in a second, is uh, more separation between units, as well as uh, passive safety features which require no action intervention for typically up to 72 hours. So if there was an event, the idea is that an operator doesn't need to do something to intervene, for 72 hours. Um, and separation of redundancies and improved as well. So the ACR design, uh, major scaling in economic and uh, economies and size, slightly modified technology. So this uses light water as a coolant loop, resulting in a negative void coefficient uh, and less trading generation. Uh, uses slightly enriched uranium, 1 to 2%, uh, to increase the burn rate and less fuel, uh, fueling cycle, longer life cycle. So this is kind of what it looks like. What you'll see here is that there's a, uh, a dosing tank. So instead of the vacuum building connecting all four units, uh, the nuclear industry is looking towards something that uh, every unit is kind of uh, independent. Uh, what, what we saw with, uh, with some events is in a multi-unit station, you've got, uh, if there's an impairment on one system, that, that puts the rest at jeopardy, so having a additional separation is improved. So in the event of a, of a uh, steam leak, that tank would spray, allowing, uh, temp uh, allowing the pressure to be reduced in the building. They also have something called passive autocatalytic uh, recombiners. So in the event there's hydrogen generation in the, uh, in the building, you've got uh, catalysts inside which are converting to water and oxygen. Uh, so it's larger, uses light water, which is a, which is a big difference, but uh, ultimately it's an evolutionary concept on the original candy design. So the next next generation uh, reactor, so uh, people are looking at breeder, so this is kind of in the research stage, if not really in the building stage right now. So, um, well actually that's not exactly true. So sodium and helium cooled fast breeder reactors. So fast breeder reactors work a little bit differently than uh, nuclear thermal reactors, which is what uh, Rand described earlier. Uh, thermal reactors require a moderator. So they rely on thermal neutrons. And what they're doing is they're slowing down the neutron. So it hit, can hit and use uh, uranium-235 as the fissile material. There's only 1%, or what is the name? Yeah. yeah, a very small amount of, the, of natural uranium is, is uranium-235. When we're talking about enrichment, we're talking about enrichment of uranium-235. The remainder is uranium-238. So uh, fast reader reactors are using fast neutrons to use the uranium-238, hence uh, use more of the fuel that's, that's there, and uh, as a result, more efficient use of the fuel in general. Uh, the other thing that I uh, noticed recently, Bill, this is something that Bill Gates gave a TED talk on, I don't know, in 2010, I'm not sure if anyone had seen it. It's about a travel and wave reactor. So in this design, it's very prototype, but uh, 
the fuel is uh, loaded at the beginning, 40 years go by, no change in fueling, essentially the, uh, the reactor burns up from one side to the other. Uh, this has some significant advantages. Um, no fueling means uh, potentially less outages, as well as it reduces uh, no online fueling machines, it reduces complexity. So that's uh, another thing, if you guys want to look at the Tencent, Tencent you can check it out. Um, the other thing that India is looking into, because of their reserves, is the thorium reactors. So can-do reactors can actually work off of thorium as well. Um, so thorium uh, works uh, very well, and it's, it's just that uranium is cheaper at this time. But uh, India, because of their reserves, have an interest in developing this technology further. The other item is uh, supercritical water-cooled reactors. So instead of using water as the primary coolant, you could use supercritical water. Uh, this has the potential to increase the efficiency of the plant from 33% to 45%. So we're talking huge increases in efficiency at this point. The other big thing that I should mention before I leave this slide is that, um, and France is already really investing in this and doing it, which is fuel reprocessing. So uh, after fuel is used, instead of saying, okay, that's it, we're done, they're uh, reprocessing it and continuing to use it. So they're only, um, mobilizing the, a very small fraction of their fuel. Most of it is going back into the reactors. So, Good question. one, yep. Okay, um, I heard somewhere that thorium doesn't uh, give radioactive waste. Is that true? Uh, I think it would. It would? Okay. Yeah. Is, and what, what's the benefit to using thorium? Uh, it's kind of an alternative energy source. So if you have it in your country, it might make sense to do that if uranium prices go up in the future. So uh, the other item that I want to talk about was the ITER project. So it's a fusion research reactor constructed that's being constructed right now in the south of France. Uh, it's a collaboration between China, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the US. And we'll use tritium and deuterium plasma heated to 150 million degrees Celsius. Um, first concrete poured was a couple months ago. And uh, it's potentially, it has potentially limitless supply. It, uh, it uses tritium, and there's a very small amount of tritium in the world, but uh, the reactor also breeds tritium so that it can use it continuously. I'm going to see if this link works. For centuries, man has looked to the stars for answers to its most pressing dilemmas. Just as curious ancient societies once sought to learn the future from the heavens, so too do today's nuclear physicists. Some believe that nuclear fusion, or the process that stars, including our sun, use to produce energy, may provide an alternative to current limited energy sources. A global collaboration was formed, consisting of the U.S., the European Union, Japan, Russia, China, India, and South Korea. Member nations are building a prototype fusion power plant known as ITER, which is Latin for the way. The objective is to understand the properties of matter undergoing intense fusion reactions and to serve as a test bed for future fusion power producing reactors. Inside the tokamak, high powered radio waves at several frequencies and highly energetic beams of neutral atoms will heat and control the plasma or the fuel in the reaction process. The plasma is an ionized gas made up of the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium that will eventually reach 150 million degrees.
After the plasma has reached a sufficient density, it is further heated by injecting extremely high velocity neutral deuterium atoms. These charged particles are confined by the magnetic field and their density continues to build over time. As the beam particles collide with the lower energy plasma particles, they transfer energy to the plasma, thereby heating it and driving current. Once in operation, ITER will serve as a working laboratory in which scientists can test the various components of the design and further refine fusion energy so that it might one day provide the world with a clean, virtually limitless energy source. Uh, that's one thing to could could be handled by a remote operator. 
a service like that? And then how, how do you go about licensing some, something like this? So, so these are all questions which uh, people in Canada are wrestling with again. So nuclear power in Ontario. So this is just kind of our energy mix. I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, from 2005 to 2015. So what you can see, and something that uh, I'm personally very proud, uh, proud of, is that um, we've, uh, we've cut back on our, on our coal emissions in, uh, in Ontario. Um, and uh, that's resulted in reduced uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions in the province of Ontario. So you'll see that this is kind of an offset by renewable energy. Um, and uh, nuclear power is pretty much stayed the same, and natural gas has, or has uh, remained about the same. So, uh, so that's how things have been changing. Uh, and in the next 20 years, six nuclear pa uh, power reactors are slated to be refurbished. Uh, four at Darlington, two at the Bruce site. Uh, Pickering will be decommissioned starting in 2020. And uh, currently, we, there's no plans for a new nuclear facility in the long-term energy plan, um, and mostly because of uh, demand. Uh, in 2008, there was a, a sh sharp decrease in the manufacturing uh, sector. D um, the demand from the electricity went down quite substantially. So nuclear power in the future. So globally, this is what uh, nuclear power looks like. Um, uh, China and India are investing heavily. Um, you can you can understand why they have uh, significant issues with uh, air air pollution in a lot of their major cities, and, and nuclear power offers a unique solution to uh, to dealing with that problem. Uh, so I'll let uh, one thing that we should touch on before we go to the conclusion is today is March 11th, and um, March 11th is a three-year anniversary of a very serious event. Um, at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, the nuclear industry takes very seriously uh, and, and uh, looked at that event very closely, including uh, senior leaders across uh, every country in, in, this, in this industry to try to, to determine how we can go about improving and, and using this event to improve our current station operation. Uh, so, so it's something that we, we should mention today. So, uh, Ed, do you want to sure, yeah. wrap it up? Thank you, Mark. So uh, just to, um, uh, to add a little bit more on your uh, Fukushima uh, uh, today's the anniversary. So uh, personally, I, I would think Fukushima is a uh, natural, natural disaster, not the, fail, uh, the failure of the technology. Uh, it is a natural disaster, tsunami, and uh, uh, the degree in terms of waves and uh, seismic uh, quakes is beyond the, the design base for the, the, the plant. And also, personally, um, I would think uh, if you were in a very active seismic zone, then you would seriously uh, reconsider having a nuclear station over there. Uh, but Japan, as you probably know from ge geography, it's an isolated, uh, four large isolated islands with not much resource, so they, do, they don't have much choice. Uh, they have a big uh, energy uh, uh, consumption, but they don't have other resources to, to, uh, to su supply the amount of energy they have. So uh, in closing, so nuclear industry, it's a very exciting and challenging and rewarding industry to work for. There's a lot of technologies from different uh, aspects, from different streams, mechanical, electrical, physics, chemistry, uh, uh, they demand engineers, scientists, maintainers, everyone uh, uh, is required to, uh, to make uh, uh, a, a nuclear station run smoothly. So working in the industry requires dedication, uh, technical competency, and a very good mental model, and we always uh, say that safety is our uh, overriding pri priority. Uh, so public employee safety is always the first thing that we, we would consider when we were, either we were doing a design, signing up a drawing, or uh, uh, to operate the valve in the station. That's always uh, what we think about. We would use things like uh, uh, peer verification and checks. We will use things like uh, precise communication to make sure uh, we don't make mistakes. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much.
refurbished uh, doesn't mean it needs to be uh, does, does it mean like certain parts need to be replaced or is it like yeah. overall everything needs to be inspected, make sure everything's uh, still passed? Mostly when you say refurbishments, that's talking about the reactor. You remember the, the fuel channels we, we, uh, we showed you? Yep. So the fuel channel is under, uh, under a lot of pressure, 8.7 megapascal pressure. So it's the degrading of the metal in the fuel channel. That's the most important thing because if that fails, then you will have, you will have a big issue. So that's when we say refurbishments, that's the most critical job in refurbishments. But we would we would uh, change and modify other and upgrade other equipments as well. But that's the most important thing. In and refurbishment. just to add to that, normally the life cycle of nuclear power plants is about forty years. So 40 years. you're only looking at refurbishment when it nears the end of the life cycle. Right? So after refurbishment, how long can it so last? Usually, it's stated for about another thirty years. Like for example, Darlington the refurbishment, they're estimating another thirty to thirty-five years of life. So. Overall, the 70 year life cycle for a nuclear power plant is very, very good for the economy as well, right? So, yeah, and the industry is currently checking and inspecting the uh, thickness and quality of the metal uh, for that future. Is it possible to do another refurbishment afterwards? Or? Uh, I don't think so. So, yeah. I don't think we've gotten to that stage in terms of the history of nuclear power in Canada, at least. And I think over the world, this has just been about 70 years overall. So, yeah. who knows what the future might hold. But um, eventually, you get to the point where you know, Xerox, Xerox, you Photocopy or photocopy, right? You eventually get to the point where it just sort of it's not worth it anymore to refurbish it um, because refurbishment is quite an economic impact as well. Right? You have new equipment, new material coming in. So, so in some to, cases, is it cheaper to just build a new one? Like yeah, yeah so like you have to do that cost You have to think that these everything like all the computers, you know, the technology example, itself. Yeah. It's that's all from the sixties and seventies. So if you think about how how your laptop, you know, how laptops have changed in the last ten years. It's a big difference, right? So, so at a certain point in time, you know, you say, "Hey, this our computer has broken." If you wanted to go, if you had a computer from the '70s and you wanted to get get it repaired, I, I don't know how many people or where you would go to, you know, get, get that supported, yeah. right? That would be very difficult. Yeah. So the. Uh when you're considering building a new a new plant, you, you will have a, a, a newer model of the reactor and you'll probably be uh, more efficient and easier to operate and have a high capacity. But uh, another uh, uh, factor you have to consider is the, uh, the approval process, the political decision the government has to make because it's a big uh, uh, cost uh, at, the, at, at, the, at the very beginning. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you guys got into, the AC R1000 yeah. nuclear plant has less tritium production. Like, can you explain more about what tritium yeah. production? Yeah. So, uh, in a heavy water, in a he if you have heavy water um, as the moderator, heavy water um, is more likely to absorb an additional neutron, and that makes it uh, tritium, ox tritium oxide. So, uh, and that is a, a radioactive uh, compound. So it has a half-life of about 10 years, and you'll see the curie content in the uh, in the reactors get up quite high. So at, at Darlington, uh, there's a tritium removal facility, so they've designed a, a system which um, uses cryogenic distillation to uh, remove tritium and isolate it, and then put fresh uh, D2O back into the system. But in, in a light water system, you need not just one neutron, we need two no neutrons, and that ends up being a much less likely, a much lower probability for that to occur. And as a result, their tritium levels uh, remain very low. And another thing you mentioned in the slides was, uh, I think, breeder reactors. You're like, yes. what's a breeder reactor? So a breeder reactor, um, so it's using, the a whole idea of a breeder reactor is you actually um, develop fissile material as um, operation proceeds. So but as the reaction goes through. So as the reaction goes, so uh, thorium actually doesn't start out very reactive. Um, this is an example. What you would do is you'd have something, a, a, a reactive component to a fuel bundle that was made out of thorium. And over time, as the thorium is uh, bombarded with neutrons, it generates uh, a material which is fissile, and so in that case, you're taking something that wasn't fissile and you're turning it into something that is fissile, 
in that in that neutron range. So, so that's like exactly creating a field, right? Like developing the field as the reaction goes through. What are the Canadian institutions that are doing reactor design? Uh, there's ACL, which is ACL stands for Atomic Energy of yeah. Canada Limited, and now uh, there's a new name called Kangoo Energy. Yeah. So they were the original designers of Kangoo technology. So they are doing the, the ACL and design. Yes, that's very cool. Are there like, some uh, smaller nuclear companies that may be doing all sorts of work from the... There's uh, Fukushima Reactor Company, and uh, we can talk to you offline. Yeah, so there's a lot of companies that are involved in the nuclear industry, yeah. okay. but in terms of Canadian candy design, ACL candy energy is the main player yeah. now. Okay. But there's a lot of players, because like Ed mentioned, um, to run a nuclear power plant, you have maintenance technicians, they're going to be coming in, right, contractors, so yeah. okay. there's a lot of companies out there. Okay. Are there any further projects in fusion area, rather than, uh, the other than ITER? Uh -huh. Are there other fusion projects? Yeah, like for I don't know. I'm very interested in this as well. I don't think there's anything in, no. to that scale, like in terms yeah. of a collaboration, but I mean, you might have heard of some, there were tales in the 40s, 50s about coal fusion being generated, like somebody discovered it and they disproved it. So fusion has always been in the minds of um, everybody, but it's just that it hasn't been perfected because so far the only source we know is the sun. Yeah, well, the hard part about fusion, I don't think it's difficult to actually produce. Yeah, fusion. you can actually make, like, you can undergo fusion, it's to maintain that reaction, like a self-sustaining um, net zero gain reactor. Like, that's, yeah. that's the hard part, like that's, having it that's the key. go forward. How do you put in less energy? Like you want energy to come out, you don't want to heat up stuff and then it just, right. yeah. it takes yeah. energy, it takes more energy to, yeah. Like we can, there's been examples of fusion all over, but it's just, we put in more energy than we get out, so it's just not working. Uh, another uh, question related to the policy side of it. Um, I know that after the Fukushima incident, uh, Germany has voted to shut down, not shut down, but not to build any new uh, nuclear That's reactor. Right, yeah. So is that where the direction is going in all the countries in the world, or is that just a, a single incident where it's so not, not, not a worldwide consideration? It just depends on the countries. But Each country is taking yeah. a different, different perspective. I think Switzerland did the same thing. Um, but the US actually just approved one of their reactors, so they're actually starting building new ones. So I think two of them just yeah. got approved recently, like last year or the year before. So the US is actually going forward with more nuclear. So it, it just depends on the individual country's policies. It also depends on your geological location and also your whether you have, if you have a large demand and you don't have the, uh, the, the, the source to, uh, to, to fit the demand, then, then you consider building uh, the, the nuclear industry. There, you also have to you also have to weigh in that uh, like in Germany there's there's huge uh, dissent against uh, the nuclear uh, against nuclear industry in Germany. So uh, when you have 60, 70 percent of the population saying we don't want this, that is eventually the direction you're going to be going. So different people, different countries. In candle reactors, do you I mean is isn't there? Uh, uh, uranium-235 enrichment going on? Do we? So in the current candle reactors, there's no enrichment going on. So we use just natural uranium. Mm -hmm. But natural uranium has 235 present in it, but yeah. very minute but quantities. Like 1 to 2%. Yeah. yeah, so there is a U-235 in candle reactors. Enrichment basically all it does is um, nat it converts natural uranium into U-235. But in natural uranium, there is some U-235. But that's why um, in candle reactors, generally, once you um, go through the fuel cycle and the fuel bundle is used up, we just put it in the ISB, and Lauren was mentioning there's um, projects where we actually reuse that fuel, right? France is one of the leaders on that. Yeah, so so in China, but there, you can use can do to actually. So in China, they are using light water reactors, taking fuel from that that's used, and putting it in their can do type reactors. Um, so can do, can, that's another thing that you can do is uh, to expend fuel from, fresh, from light water reactor designs. So that but that's one, really uh, that one pellet can be used. It, it has an immense amount of energy. Like yeah. radioactive energy is very um, potent. It's just that our current technology is sort of like we just use it once and we don't really know what to do with the rest of it. So now they're coming up with the plans where we reuse that fuel. Yeah. Because I heard that uh, enrichment is a very painstaking process, and so isn't this an advantage? I mean, definitely. Candle. That's why candle was developed. Um, 
in the beginning, like we mentioned, it's because of that whole nuclear proliferation issue in the during the world wars mm -hmm. that can do is developed because you don't have to go through enrichment. There's, it's just naturally occurring uranium, so you don't have to go through the um, world politics and making sure you get all the licenses and things like that. And there's no danger. There's no risk. It mitigates the risk of proliferation. It's a, it's a safe technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the cost of electricity, um, including transmission, distribution, uh, nuclear nuclear generation? I know uh, wind is about 11 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, solar is about 39. So the levelized cost yep. with um, decommissioning, this is this is the number I had, it's like 5 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the, such a long duration of the, of the station life. Yeah. For 40 years you get just for investing in the fabric, so it, it pays off over the long run. Do you deal at all with uh, waste? Nuclear waste? Yeah, right. definitely. Yeah, so every nuclear power plant um, generates waste in terms of not just the fuel that's being used, but also just other waste in terms of our process systems, um, any personal protective equipment that, you know, in personal and radioactive areas, it, there's a lot of waste that's being generated. But um, we have a very efficient process in dealing with that, so in um, nuclear industry, what they do is generally they segregate it into two components, active waste, inactive waste. And in some cases, they actually take it up to incinerate it, compact it, store it in um, dry containers, things like that. So there's a huge process in terms of waste management. And I believe Ontario is looking into the DGR as well. I think yeah. we might know about that as well. Yeah, so there's a deep geological repository uh, that was proposed in uh, outside of Ontario. So uh, that's for intermediate, not so the fuel generally is stored on site in the fuel bins, the IFPs. Uh, if you don't like enrich the uranium and then it comes out as waste, does that mean you create more waste than you would have uh, compared to like uh, reactors that use enriched uranium? I don't think so because you know. they take they take it so they take a natural uranium uh, <coughs> pellet, let's say. And then they turn it into enriched uranium, and they put it into the reactors, and then it's done. So we take, we skip the enrichment step. So it's still the same amount of material, but in the enrichment process, they might have some waste generated as well. But in our case, um, it's just we put it in uranium, and it comes out as just the fuel, right? So the loose fuel. So there's really no extra waste that's generated from the nuclear reaction. If anything, we get less of the fuel out because some of it is used up. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned in Germany as well, 70% against nuclear power. What is it in Ontario? Uh, I think it's about 50 So Yeah, could you talk a little bit about the uh, nuclear industry in the next five to 10 years? Is, it, is there going to be growth or is it going to be decline? Uh, it's very good question. <laughs> I think there's going to be short term growth, but I can't. Like probably we're contemplating that too. We're not sure either. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Right. You also mentioned that there is a new, uh, reactor being considered in uh, Alberta. Could you yeah. elaborate a little bit on that as well? Is it in the uh, planning stage or even before that? I think I it's think just in the planning stage. Yeah, it's still uh, um, up to the politicians to make. So what? That's not approved yet. No, I don't think so. No. I don't think there's any reactor in Canada that's approved yet. The U.S. just has to approve. In Ontario, there are plans to, to refurbish uh, some reactors in Darlington and Andrews, so that would be a good opportunity as well. And the, uh, the new, uh, there, are, there were plans to build two new reactors in Darlington, but uh, that, uh, again, is a political debate, so right now it's on hold. Uh, we don't know how, what's going to happen to that. Uh, most likely it depends on the, the market demand. If we have a lot of the the industry is back in Ontario, they're consuming a lot of power. We have the demand, then that was probably a good opportunity to go. Right, I have a follow-up question. So why do you think um, all the reactors were built in Ontario but not for other places? Because I know the mines for uranium is actually located in Saskatchewan or yeah. somewhere yeah. close to that, right? So why was how come other provinces, uh, especially in the West, didn't consider it? it's a supply and demand. In the West, they don't have that list. So, it's, for example, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, they're mostly uh, agricultural. They don't have that much industry. Also, they have a lot of uh, hydropower. Uh, same for Quebec. Quebec has a lot of uh, hydropower as well. So, that's a renewable source as well. So, uh, that's why they do not have the, uh, these uh, uh, nuclear reactors in those provinces. I, I don't know the exact numbers of the, uh, of the support for nuclear as well. Yeah. But I think it's about 
But I have a feeling that uh, they have considered nuclear power in Saskatchewan because you know here's the mine, it right. makes sense to put it. And but uh, but I think that there is a, a stronger uh, dissenting voice there. Probably. I don't think that. But uh, speak of a public opinion, the uh, the uh, local communities around the nuclear station usually they have a higher support rate to for the, uh, for, for the nuclear industry. Yep. For the design progress for the ACR and so the where is going to be like the uh, design is going to be? <laughs> so I think the design is pretty much like they have started marketing it, uh, yeah. but in terms of actually implementing so the ACR 1000, yeah. again they're not sure. Yeah. Well, at first, I'm going to say that the factory design is going very fast. Mm. Um, yeah. We will know about that. Yeah. So we say we're going to be. If we make more nuclear plants, we're going to still use a candle, 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 For example, a nuclear, like Ram was saying, is uh, good for base load. For example, hydropower is renewable. It's also a, a green uh, energy uh, source as well. But hydro has higher loads as well. In the winter, you will have less water, uh, lower water level in the river. There will be ice build up, and you wouldn't be running the turbines if you have ice in the water. So you, some of the uh, power plants has to be shut down or reduced to a very low uh, low capacity for hydropower. Same for wind or uh, solar. Uh, if the wind stops blowing today, it doesn't mean you're going to stop using your electronics today, right? So that's uh, so that, that, that that's, why, that's why those things cannot be used for a base load. And yeah. you can use thermal power, but that would, that means you will increase your carbon carbon emission. Yeah. Is there some research to try to consider the idea of uh, intersecting uh, wasted solar energy? Most of it is lost in space, like uh, in space, and being microwave, like something like orbiting the sun, and like a big mirror, whatever it is, grab the energy from space and beam it with much of the weight on Earth. Is there research? Is it I, I heard something about yeah, that, where they wanted to beam um, microwave energy from space, but there were a lot of issues with that, um, primarily due to um, health concerns. I think it's like, you know, if the fire flies through that, it's going to get fried. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure on the details of that, but those were along the lines of what I heard was the um, drawback of that. She's, she's talking about space space, like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, the space of being like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there was a lot of health concerns with that. Oh, yeah. Okay. The surrounding area. Yeah. Around that area. I'm not very familiar with it. But they are trying to do Wi-Fi with that, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. this, uh, this question is a little, like a little personal. So how did you, each one of you, got, uh, got into the nuclear industry? And uh, are there uh, new grant programs or anything like that at uh, the place you work? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, I joined uh, Ontario Power Generation in 2005. I did some internships before I did the DUI. Uh, in the electrical um, field, but not in the nuclear industry. Um, at that time, uh, I think even now, uh, they still hire new grads every single year. I'm not sure about the exact numbers they hire, but and they also have a summer and intern program as well. Um, the same as Bruce uh, Power as well. Yuli yeah. yeah. is one of the interns who is working on Ontario. Right now. So I joined in 2007 slash 8, so I did my internship at PY is actually with OPG, 
and then once I graduated, I joined Norwegian full time. So there was a huge um, hiring uh, sort of increase in the 2005 to 2008 time. Um, since then, sort of due to just general attrition policies in Ontario and things like that, it's slowed down a little bit. But we are still hiring OPG. I know Bruce Bauer is hiring. Um, so there is still opportunities in the new industry, and it doesn't just have to be with the generators, with yeah. the utilities. There's a lot of interface organizations, contractors, design agencies that have a play in nuclear energy. So mm -hmm. there's lots of scope out there for nuclear power, definitely. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. If you guys have any other questions, we'll stick around for another couple, for 10 or so minutes. So uh, let us know. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.